The opening series of prayers in the Mass are all about getting ready. We're getting our hearts ready for a most profound encounter with God. God is coming to speak to us, really, through His inspired words in Scripture. And God is coming to meet us in His sacramental presence in the Eucharist. Jesus is coming down upon our altars, and we're going to receive Him in Holy Communion. We can't just expect to step out of our busy lives, come into a church and show up at Mass, and be able to hear God's Word attentively and receive Jesus in the Eucharist reverently. We need some time of transition, some time of preparation, some time to settle down, clear our thoughts, and most of all, to prepare our hearts for this most sacred encounter with God. I think about those ancient Israelites who took time to prepare themselves before they encountered God at Mount Sinai. The Bible says the Israelites consecrated themselves for three days before God spoke to them in the words of the covenant. If the ancient Israelites took preparation so seriously before encountering God, so should we. And that's what we do in the introductory rites. So I was traveling on a plane to go to a conference and I noticed that the woman next to me when we leveled off at 38,000 feet pulled out a Bible. And then she pulled out some pens and a Bible devotional book and she's writing in it and I'm realizing she's doing a Bible study at 38,000 feet. That's really cool. So I asked her, so excuse me, ma'am, are, are you a Christian? And she said, oh yeah, I'm a Pentecostal. And then she asked me, are you a Christian? And I replied, oh yeah. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> and she looked at me with a little suspicion and said, uh-huh. But then we got to know each other. She told me she was traveling to go visit her son and she asked me where I was traveling to. And I said, I'm going to a Catholic conference and there's gonna be a thousand Catholics gathering at this conference to study the biblical foundations of our entire Catholic faith. And I'm actually one of the presenters. I'm gonna be giving a talk on the biblical foundations of the mass. And I'm gonna show how if we can understand the biblical background to all that we're saying and doing in the mass, we'll be able to encounter Jesus more profoundly at every mass. Now this woman was a little overwhelmed meeting a Catholic, maybe for the first time, that spoke so passionately about the Bible and their Catholic faith. But she was a very sweet lady and she smiled and she said, well, I, I, I once went to a mass when I was 16 years old. And wow, there was a lot of standing up and sitting down and people saying things out of some book. I didn't know what was going on, but I sure had a sense that there was something deeper happening in the mass. Something deeper happening in the mass. Have you ever encountered that something deeper? You know, I think sometimes we as Catholics can take the Mass for granted. We show up Sunday after Sunday. We go through the motions. And sometimes it takes an outsider to remind us that there's something deeper happening in all these rituals, all these prayers, all of these symbols in the Mass. Do you know that something deeper? I think if we can understand biblically the biblical background to all that we say, all that we do, all of the rituals and all the prayers, that we can then enter into the liturgy so much more profoundly and experience that something deeper in the Mass. The Mass consists of four parts. The two main parts are the Liturgy of the Word, where we hear God's Word speaking to us in the Scriptures, and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, where the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ, and we receive Jesus in Holy Communion. Those two main parts of the Mass are framed around the introductory rites and the concluding rites. Today, we're going to focus our attention on the introductory rites, which are all about preparing our hearts to encounter God in His Word and in His Sacrament. The whole Mass begins with the sign of the cross. But did you know that the sign of the cross isn't just the way Catholics begin their prayers? 
It actually is a powerful prayer in and of itself. In the sign of the cross, we do two things. We trace the cross over our bodies, but we also say these sacred words. We say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When we call on God's name like we do in the sign of the cross, that follows ancient biblical practice. Throughout the scriptures, men and women call on God's name. We see in the book of Genesis chapter 4, Adam's son, Seth calls on the name of the Lord. Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. Moses calls on God's name. David calls on God's name. The Psalms call on God's name. All throughout scripture, people are calling on the name of God. When we call on God's name, we're invoking his presence. We're calling on him in worship. We're inviting him into our lives. How fitting it is that we do this in the Mass. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. The idea of invoking God's name is to invoke his presence. And how fitting that is that we do that at the beginning of every Mass. cross over our bodies also has profound roots in sacred scripture. It goes all the way back to the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 9, verse 4. Let me put you into the scene. Ezekiel's living in a time of cultural crisis. There are many in Jerusalem who have gone astray and are even worshiping other gods. Even some of the elders in the temple are worshiping idols. So God announces judgment on Jerusalem. He announces that a foreign nation is going to come in and destroy the city and carry the people off into slavery. But not everyone in Jerusalem has been unfaithful. There are some who remain loyal to God and following God's ways and not the world's ways. And those people, those faithful ones, are going to get a spiritual mark on their forehead. And we read about this in Ezekiel 9.4. It's the spiritual mark of the Hebrew letter Ta, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that interestingly looks kind of like a cross. And so this mark on the forehead was a sign of their fidelity. They were set apart. These were the faithful ones. But it was also a sign of protection, that these were the ones that were going to be protected by God when judgment would fall on the city. So you can imagine how the early Christians, when they started practicing their sign of the cross, they saw it as prophetically foreshadowed in Ezekiel chapter 9. They saw that when they were making the sign of the cross while living in the midst of a pagan Roman culture, that it was as if they were saying, we want to follow your ways, God. We want to follow your standards for life, for love, for success, for happiness. We want to follow you, not what the world says about these things. So it was a beautiful sign of fidelity, but it was also a sign of protection. That they believed that when they made the sign of the cross, that they were protected from temptation, protected from all harm and danger, protected from sin. Consider how one early church father, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, tells us how the early Christians made the sign of the cross all the time throughout their daily lives. There was such power in the sign of the cross. He said, let the cross be boldly made with our fingers upon our brow and on all occasions, over the bread we eat, over the cups we drink, in our comings and in our goings, before sleep, on lying down and rising up, when we're on our way and when we are still. It is a powerful safeguard, for it is a grace from God, a badge of the faithful. Let me pause there and say, a badge for the faithful. You see, the sign of the cross, like in Ezekiel's time, was a sign of our faithfulness. The sign that we are marked off, that we're not going along with the rest of the world's ways. And Cyril goes on to say that the sign of the cross is also a terror to the devils. For when they see the cross, they are reminded of the crucified. And they fear him who has smashed the heads of the dragons. So we see from Cyril the power of the sign of the cross, and we can access that power in our daily lives today. We can make the sign of the cross not just at Mass and not just at the beginning of a prayer, but at any time of trouble or difficulty. And when we do that, we're, we're begging God to say, help me, God, help me to follow you. Help me to be faithful to you in the midst of this secular culture. Help me to be a disciple and be faithful. But we can also draw on the power of the sign of the cross to make those demons flee. That's what Cyril was talking about. And the early Christians saw that when you made the sign of the cross, when you face temptation, when you face trial in life, that the demons that are afflicting you would flee. Do you struggle in life? Do you have moments of discouragement 
moments of anger? Do you have moments when you struggle with pride, you struggle with vanity, you worry too much about what other people think? Make the sign of the cross. Do you struggle with gossip? You talk about other people, you criticize others. When you notice yourself facing that temptation, make the sign of the cross. It is a badge of the faithful and a terror to the devils. One other beautiful thing we can do is trace the sign of the cross even over our own children in our home. It's a beautiful thing to set them apart, to follow God's ways, but to also protect them from all harm, from all danger, and most of all, spiritual danger, protecting them from the ways of the devil and protecting them from sin. At the beginning of Mass, when the priest says, the Lord be with you, He's not just saying, hey, good morning, everybody. And, and then we reply, hey, and right back at you, Father. No, that's not what this is about. This is not an ordinary greeting. If we understood what those words mean from the biblical perspective, we would approach every mass with a little more fear and trembling. Because these words, the Lord be with you, are used over and over again in the Bible when God is addressing someone that he's setting apart, that he's sending on a very important mission. They're gonna be stretched like never before. They're gonna to have to rely on God like never before. And so that's why God or the angel will say, the Lord is with you. The Lord will help you do what you can't do on your own. I think about many of the great heroes in the Old Testament, people like Moses at the burning bush. You know, we often hear the story, God talked to Moses at the burning bush, and we think that's really special. But think about Moses. Put yourself in his shoes and imagine what he's going through. God is telling Moses to go back to Egypt, the land where people were trying to kill him. And he's sent on a mission to go confront the wicked dictator Pharaoh to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Do you think that's a job Moses was gunning for? You know, Moses is freaked out by this job. He's worried. He's wondering, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not eloquent. I'm not a good leader. The people aren't going to believe in me. And what does God do? God comes to Moses and says, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will help you do what you cannot do on your own. The same is true with Joshua. Joshua is told in the book of Joshua chapter 1 to go into the promised land, to lead the people into this land where there's large armies ready to pounce on the Israelites. And what is Joshua told by God? I will be with you. Be courageous, Joshua, for I will be with you. Gideon hears these words when he's called to fight off the Midianites. He doesn't have an army. He doesn't have any military training. And yet the angel is telling him, God's sending you to, to help liberate the Israelites from the Midianites. And, and, and Gideon's told, the Lord will be with you. David hears these words when he's beginning his kingship. The prophets hear these words at the beginning of their prophetic ministry. And a young virgin in Nazareth named Mary heard those words from Gabriel when she was told that she would be the mother of the Messiah. So over and over again throughout biblical salvation history, these words are always used to address people that are being sent on a daunting, sacred mission. Do you ever feel overwhelmed in your life? Do you have areas in your life where you feel inadequate for the task? Maybe at work, maybe in your marriage, maybe in, in raising children, and you, you just feel like, I, I don't know if I can do this. Well, at every Mass, we hear those words, the Lord be with you, to remind us that we don't have to do these responsibilities, these roles, these missions all on our own, that God is with us to help us to fulfill what he has in store for us. But why do we hear these words in the liturgy? What do they mean in the context of the Mass? These words are signaling to us that God is calling us to a very important sacred mission right here in the liturgy. We are getting ready to encounter Almighty God himself in his word, in the liturgy of the word, and in the Eucharist, in the liturgy of the Eucharist. We can't just walk in and expect to have our hearts all prepared for this moment. We need to get spiritually ready. So that's why the priest says, the Lord be with you. He's reminding us that we, like Moses and Joshua and Gideon, are called to this sacred task, and we will not be left alone. We're not worthy to hear God and receive God in this way, and yet God tells us that we're invited, and he calls us and he will be with us to prepare our hearts for this most sacred encounter. After the priest says, the Lord be with you, we respond saying, and with your spirit. 
Now, what does that mean? This isn't just a kind of a ordinary response. This isn't like, hey, and right back at you, Father, may God be with you too. No, when we say, and with your spirit, we are addressing the priest, the spirit of the priest. In other words, the most interior part of the priest who was ordained to perform these sacred rites. We are basically saying, be the priest we need you to be for us. We know there's only one priest, Jesus Christ, but may he work through you to perform these sacred mysteries. One of the most important things we can do to prepare ourselves to encounter God in the Liturgy of the Word, in the Liturgy of the Eucharist, is to confess our sins. And that's what we do in this prayer known as the Confitior, the I Confess Prayer. I love this prayer because it's a powerful examination of conscience. We can use this prayer not just at Mass, but throughout our lives to consider the many ways we fall short from giving the best of ourselves to God and the people in our lives. We confess different kinds of sins, the sins in our thoughts, in our words, in what we've done, and in what we've failed to do. Think about those four areas. Just, just think about the sins we have in our thoughts. Do you have angry thoughts? Do you have impatient thoughts? Do you have lustful thoughts? Do you have anxious thoughts? Those are things that we bring to confession and we confess those things even here at Mass. But it's not just in our thoughts, it's also in our words. Do we gossip? Do we tear down? Do we use our speech to build up or do we use our words to tear people down? We can also think about not just our thoughts and words, but our actions. Are our actions just? Are we giving the best of ourselves in the workplace? Are we giving the best of ourselves to our spouse, to our children? Are we giving the best of ourselves to God in prayer? But I think the hardest part of this I Confess prayer is the last part of this examination of conscience. Not just the sins we've done, but also what we failed to do, the good that we failed to do. Think about that. Most of us probably have enough sins in our thoughts and in our words and the things that we do, but we're also responsible for the good that we fail to do. Are we giving the best of ourselves to God and to the people in our lives? And then the prayer goes on and we say, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And we strike our breast as we say those words. Why do I have this action of striking the breast? Well, that's a biblical practice. In the ancient Jewish world, striking the breast was an expression of sorrow, an expression of contrition, an expression of repentance. We see in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, at the cross, there are people who leave the cross realizing that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, and they walk away striking their breasts, sorrowful over what happened to Christ on Good Friday. But why do we also say this three times? Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Can't I just say it once? Why do I have to repeat this three times? Well, I think about in most human relationships, when you do something that really hurts someone else, you feel really badly about it. And a simple apology isn't enough. Like if I do something that really hurts my wife, I don't just say, oh, I apologize. No, no, I say, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I, I didn't mean that. I, I, I wish I didn't hurt you. I, I wish I could take that, but I'm sorry. I, I say I'm sorry in multiple ways because I really feel badly that I hurt her and I hurt our relationship. If we have real sorrowful hearts over the ways we've hurt other people and the ways we've hurt our relationship with God, we don't just give an apology to God. No, we say through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. This prayer helps us to approach God with great humility and truly sorrowful hearts. I want to make sure we all experience the power of God's mercy in this prayer known as the Kyrie, the Lord have mercy prayer. I love this prayer, but unfortunately, I think today there's a lot of misunderstanding about what mercy is really all about. In fact, Maybe some of us have an impression that mercy is kind of like that little kid's game called mercy. Have you ever played mercy as a little kid? I want to bring up my friend John here. I want to illustrate this game. So in this game, two people, they, they put their hands together like this, and it's a tournament of strength. And we're trying to overpower the other person. But let's say John's stronger than me, and my wrist is, is really hurting, and it's about to break. But the only way the game ends is if I cry out, mercy, and then he lets go, and I get my wrist back. <laughs> Thank you, John. But is that what biblical mercy is really all about? Is that what we're calling upon 
in the mass when we say, Lord, have mercy? Is it as if God is up there and he sees our wretchedness, our sins and our mistakes, and we just say, mercy, God, don't send me to hell and don't send me to purgatory too long? Is that really what mercy is all about? You see, in the Bible, one of the words that's often translated mercy or expresses the point of mercy is the Hebrew word hesed. And hesed describes total unconditional love, covenantal love, unconditional it's the love that describes God's love for us. It describes how God loves us no matter what we do, no matter how many times we do it, no matter how far we've turned away from him, he still loves us. And all he wants to do is remove whatever barriers keep us from union with him. You see, sometimes we can get the impression that God's just up in heaven, he's just counting, you know, you did that wrong and you did that wrong and you did that wrong. And then we think all of our mistakes and our failures and our weaknesses and sins have to define us. I've got all these black marks on my soul. But it doesn't have to be that way. You see, God sees more than just our mistakes and our sins. He sees our hearts. I'm reminded of a time when I was watching my two kids playing in the living room. I was in another room just observing them. And I noticed that the little boy was playing with one of his favorite toys. But then the little sister came up and took the toy out of his hands and started to walk away. And as I was over here watching, I, I, I thought, uh-oh, that, that's, that's a problem. And so a flag on the play, you know, personal foul. You know, there's a, a legal violation there. You can't steal your brother's toy. So I was about to stand up to come in to discipline the older sister. But then the older sister noticed that the little, little boy was very sad and was about to cry and she felt badly. She wasn't aware I was even watching, but she felt badly on her own accord and she wanted to set things right. And as she saw him about to cry, she put the toy back in his lap and she said, I'm sorry, and gave him a big hug. Now, as a dad over here, I'm watching all this. And I'm like, wow, I'm just blown away. Wow, that's amazing. You know, did, 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 did that just happened? That, that's awesome. And as a father, I didn't want to just come in and issue discipline at this moment. I, I just want to go in. I just want to go hug my kids. Way to go, kids. That's awesome. You see, I think as a dad, I saw more than my daughter's little violation at that moment, her mistake. I saw her heart. I saw that she felt badly about this already. And her heart was already contrite. She wanted to set things right, and she gave him the toy back. And I think our Heavenly Father looks at us the same way. Our Heavenly Father looks at us, and he sees more than just our mistakes. He sees our hearts. And all we have to do is turn back to him. If he sees that our hearts are already regretting what we did, we're repentant of what we did. We're, we're trying to make amends. We're trying to set things right, especially he sees we bring those sins to confession. When he sees we truly are sorry, he sees more than our mistakes. He sees our hearts. So let's approach God with confidence. If we're truly sorry, we don't have to approach God in shame. We should approach him with great trust, trust in his love for us, confidence in his mercy. In the Kyrie, we're primarily entrusting our sins to God's mercy, but we can also look at mercy in the Kyrie a little more broadly. From a biblical perspective, we know that many people approach Jesus crying out for mercy for sufferings in their lives. For example, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, the two blind men approach Jesus and say, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now they're approaching Jesus asking for mercy, not just for their own sins, but for their suffering, their blindness. This is what we can do, too, in the Mass. We can approach Jesus. Do you have areas in your life where you need healing, where you need God's help? Maybe there's, there's certain wounds that you have from your past, wounds from your childhood. Maybe there's certain sins that you just struggle with and you, you, you find yourself not able to change. Maybe you struggle with anxiety, you struggle with fear. All these things we can bring to Jesus in the liturgy and say, have mercy on me, Lord, have mercy. Another thing we can see from the Gospels is that there are many people who approach Jesus asking for mercy, not just for themselves, but for the people they love who are suffering. So for example, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, a woman approaches Jesus and says, have mercy on me, Lord, for my daughter is possessed by a demon. And in Matthew chapter 17, there's a father who says, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and he suffers terribly. 
So maybe you have people in your life who are suffering. Maybe you could pray, Lord, have mercy on my father who's ill, or Lord, have mercy on my son who just left the church, or Lord, have mercy on my daughter who's lost in life and is very unhappy. We can entrust all those we love to Jesus in the Kyrie. When we come to the Gloria, we often sing this beautiful prayer, but I want you to know that this prayer is inspired not by any ordinary human hymn book. It actually is inspired by what the angels sang over the fields of Bethlehem on that very first Christmas night. The angels sang, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. So did you realize whenever we sing the Gloria at mass, we're singing a Christmas song? But why are we singing a Christmas song all throughout the year, even in July and August and September? It's because in a sense, the mystery of Christmas is made present to us again, sacramentally, in the Eucharist. So all throughout the introductory rites, we're preparing our hearts for that profound moment when God comes down upon our altars under the appearance of bread and wine in the Eucharist. And so it's fitting that we welcome that same Jesus that was welcomed by the angels some 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. We welcome that same Jesus with those same words, glory to God in the highest. After the Gloria, the priest prays a short prayer known as the Collect, where he collects or gathers the intentions of the people to conclude the introductory rites. Now, here at the end of the introductory rites, now that we have invoked God's presence in the sign of the cross, we've confessed our sins and entrusted ourselves to his mercy, and we sung his praises with the angels in the Gloria, now our hearts are prepared to listen to him in the liturgy of the word. Thank you.